God, we thank you that we are your children and you call us your children. We thank you that you love us and that you were willing to give up your life for us. Thank you for that sacrifice that you made. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you welcome everybody today? Greet the people beside you. Good morning, Northridge. <laughs> Today I am thankful for Elliot. He filled in at the last minute to do the, and not only was he manning the computer, his whole family comes early, and today was extra early, and he was babysitting while he was doing that, so way to go. Uh, I was thinking about how much we love comfort. We crave to be comfortable, and I was even thinking, oh no, there's not going to be coffee today during the middle of the service, and I'm like, how lame is that, that that means so much to us, and uh, that's such a sacrifice, right? <laughs> um, and we care about our rights, and I am... Um, Jesus, as Jesus followers, he flipped the script, and he's all about sacrifice, not about comfort, but he, he wants us to sacrifice our lives so we can have life, and one of the best examples in the Bible, well, one of them, is the, the widow, a and uh, in Mark 12, 41 to 44, it says, Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they have a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. And women back then didn't have a way of making money. So not only did she sacrifice everything that she had, but she didn't even have the opportunity to get that back. And so that was a true sacrifice of trust. And the th I was trying to, I was reading a little bit more about it and what that shows us. And first of all, Jesus noticed her and he saw her as a model of devotion, an example of worship and a true lover of God. And not only that, she modeled Christian maturity. She showed an extreme amount of faith and trust in God in, and hope and love. And so I just think that's such a good example for us, how little we're willing to give up a portion of what God has given us, but she's willing to give it all because he gave it all for us. Let's pray. God, we thank you for these examples and the example you have been for us. And God, you are such an example of provision, protection, and guidance. And there's so much wisdom in everything that you did and you pointed out. And God, we thank you for this example of a widow. I pray that we will have that faith and that trust. Um, God, let us, be, uh, let us give our lives as sacrifices to you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. So, like I mentioned before, we don't actually have coffee back here, but we do have it after the service. So uh, you can grab that afterwards. Uh, the other announcements I have is April 2nd, we are doing a four square wide worship night. And it's up at North Side. Uh, I can give you the address if you need it. <laughs> so it's up at North Side, April 2nd. It's a Sunday night at 630. And so our church and all the other four square churches in the lower mainland are gathering together for a really great worship night. And um, Derek Sanderson's going to be bringing the word. So I encourage everybody to come. I think it's going to be a powerful night. And it's a good chance to connect with all of our friends with other churches. Uh, April 6th, if you, who here has been taking Alpha? Anybody? That's a pretty good number of you guys. So after Alpha, this is a great follow-up. Or if you'd like to know and learn more about Northridge, this is a great opportunity for you too. So starting April 6th on Thursday nights, we're going to be starting growth tracks. And more information on that will be coming. And then April 23rd, it's another Sunday night down the line, is 
ladies' night. <laughs> so uh, we're going to have that here on uh, the 23rd, and you can just mark your calendars for that. Uh, let's, you can come on up, David. <laughs> Thanks, Krista. You guys are getting so well trained to woohoo. That's fantastic. Hey, good job. I'm looking out for the first time. I generally like to sit near the front so that I'm not distracted by people coming in or lack thereof. And uh, to be quite honest, I was sorry if this makes it sound like I didn't have a lot of faith in you, but I did not expect to see a whole lot of people here an hour earlier than normal. So good for you. Um, for those of you at home, <laughs> did I hear a woohoo? <laughs> woohoo. Uh, the Rays were here really early this morning. Actually, I wanted to comment too on the youthfulness across the stage. And and as much as Megan and Ryan are fountains of youth and very youthful, you can clap for that, that's a good job. Um, they are fountains of youth. Their firstborn son is now being put to work and is, is ministering. So that's, that's their son, Elliot, who is uh, doing the uh, PowerPoint this morning. Um, yeah, good job. And who's giving him kudos? Is that Declan? Yeah, good job. He's his hype man. Woo, woo. Um, as much as I'm thankful for those of you who have gathered this morning and for those of you who are watching live online, my prayer for those, because there are people missing that either missed their clock or like, yeah, no, I'm not doing an hour earlier. Uh, my prayer for you, and this is going to sound twisted and weird and selfish maybe, but I, I'm praying that you will find the online experience to be lacking. Sorry, Alex. But um, uh, uh, there is something that can't be replicated about the actual physical gathering. Um, uh, when I get to stand shoulder to shoulder, it's fun sitting next to my wife because she's a really good singer. But when you, s when you sit in here and you hear the voices together, there's a richness and there's, a, there's just something about being together. There's something about gathering. There's something about uh, running into people once again in the hallways that you haven't seen all week or a couple weeks. Uh, there's something about the physical gathering. And so, uh, unfortunately, my prayer for you online is that you will find this experience today. You'll be like, yeah, you know what? It's good, and, and this is good. We, and we do it for a reason. We don't want you to miss out on the, the thread of message and the opportunity to worship. But we hope that you do find that it lacks what you normally experience here in the room. So that's my prayer. I, hopefully that doesn't sound too backwards. Um, we're going to do something a little bit different this morning. We're going to do something a lot different, something we've never done before, uh, right in this moment. And I'm going to give you a bit of history. First, let's put up the slide. Uh, it starts with spiritual life. It's the slide. Uh, it's our prayer prompt. And I'm going to give you a brief little bit of history as to how this got on the screen. And I should have dismissed the kids. No, you know what? You can pray with us. I'll dismiss you after this. Um, unless you've already gone, in which case it's too late. Um, the, the brief history of this slide, uh, I serve on our, our Ridge Meadows ministerial executive. So that means the, the pastors gather. We gather every Wednesday morning to pray together, but then we gather once a week, um, for the, once a week, once a month for a, a luncheon where uh, sometimes we'll have some professional development. Um, we will, again, pray together, share our stories, and it's a neat place. And then... This ministerial, we, we meet to try and kind of make sure these things go smoothly. We, we were in planning for Good Friday um, and things like that. But one of the initiatives that was proposed and that I have to confess that I bristled to, so I, w I did not receive this idea well when it was first presented, was this idea of a ministerial-wide or a city-wide prayer prompt initiative where these prayer prompts, uh, try and say that 10 times fast, where these would be given to each church and the churches would be enc encouraged to make this a part of their services. And I had two negative reactions. I'm, I'm confessing my stupidity in front of you all. Um, my first one was, I don't really love the idea that what we're doing in our local space, in this place, is influenced from people who are not a part of our gathering. It, it, I, I didn't, it didn't sit right with me. Because we're really intentional about the, the flow from beginning to end of a weekend service. There's a lot of thought that goes into it, and there's some unity 
to that. And I, and I worried that this would um, work against that unity and that unification of the, of the purpose of gathering for that Sunday morning. So that was the first thing I wrestled at. The second thing was that our services are often quite busy. You'll notice that you probably notice the times I talk faster. Uh, it's just like I, I feel this anxiety about getting through everything that we have to present uh, or share or teach on a given weekend. And so there's already that, that heightened tension. And the idea of setting aside time to do this was something that I was definitely bristling against. And I voiced my opinion because I do that. I, I shared with him, I'm like, I don't like this idea. And I, to um, this fellow's credit, he didn't get offended by what I, by what I had to say. He said, here's what I'm thinking, and this is why I think we should do this. He, he says, when we gather over the weekend, at our, often our, our Sunday morning service, when we gather, quite regularly, the pastor will pray over the congregation or lead prayer. But how often do we leverage this time where we've got the saints gathered for prayer, for intentional prayer? How often do we activate our people in prayer. And I, I felt very convicted at, at this idea where it's, it's often me praying at you or praying for you or praying over you. And it's not us praying together. So let's call this an experiment that I'm excited about. What we're going to do right now is we are going to pray under this prompt for this week, we're going to be praying over the spiritual life. And let me just read the descriptor. Well, I've got it right here. Uh, pray for growth and deepening of the spiritual life of all those involved in our congregations, both your own and all churches in the city. And it may sound like I wrote this because of how much emphasis we put on growth last week, but I didn't. And so isn't that interesting how unified this message is? Um, but this is what we're going to do, is we're going to set aside the time. And Megan, I didn't work this out with you, but do you mind just padding in the background? Um, Meg is just going to give us a little bit of um, noise in the background and we've got the prompt up here and this is going to be a time we're going to set aside not a long time but a set a consecrated amount of, like set aside a set apart time right now where we're all going to be praying for this and I want to say one more thing I want to teach this a little bit um, you might find that you're sitting next to somebody who begins praying in a heavenly language, a language you don't recognize. Um, just so you know, and we don't teach very deeply to this as often as maybe we should, and we will be in, in the fall for sure, is, is when the Holy Spirit comes, sometimes with that comes this gift of speaking in a heavenly language. And so you might not recognize the words being spoken by a person next to you. They might not. I, but I want to encourage you. I want you to be praying for this. You can pray it in your head, quietly to the Father. You can pray your prayers out loud. You can speak in tongues. This is your time. This is a, a set aside time for you to be praying for the spiritual life of our congregations and our cities, even in your households. All right? So I'm just going to pause, and I will close us in prayer and take us into the message. All right? Let's pray together.
Father, help us to go deeper. Help us to walk more fully in relationship with you. Lord, we, we love this time set aside on a Sunday morning or a Saturday night or a Sunday afternoon. Whenever we gather, Lord, we, we thank you for that time that is set aside, that we can give our, our full focus. We can leave things at the door that are about the week, but we can come and give our full focus to this time with you. But Father, I pray there would be this um, consistency in our walk and that this depth that we pursue perhaps on a Sunday morning or at a Bible study or whatever, this depth that we pursue of relationship with you would be something that is a part of us, that goes with us as we go, where we go. And that the, the beautiful things, the testimonies we have because of what you've done in our lives, that we, we wouldn't be able to shut up about it. We wouldn't be able to keep it to ourselves. That we would become a blessing because of the way you blessed us. Father, I thank you for the students who are still here. And we pray that they would not discount themselves as a result of their youthfulness. That they would be able to pray these kinds of prayers for the people they're walking in circles with for their immediate communities, their classrooms, their friendship groups. That they would be able to pray with boldness and courage that their friends would know you and that together they would walk deeply with you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, and now at this time, we do dismiss those who are grade 5 to 12. You're free to go to your classes. Be blessed. Bye, Hannah. Hannah's our Hayden today. <laughs> Hannah often asks me, who is, who is your favorite? Of, they've, they're four of the kids. And Hannah really is, is curious about who I like the most between Hayden, Hannah, Isaac, and Matthew. I tell her, I tell her, her just, I'm like a little afraid of Hannah, actually. A little bit afraid of Hannah. Yeah. <laughs> we all are, yeah. She keeps us in line. All right. Good morning again. Um... Today we're, we're moving into Luke 14, and, and in Luke 14, we're actually going to go through the entire uh, section of Luke 14. So if I start talking fast, it's because there's a lot of uh, text to get through, but it's really good. I couldn't, I couldn't think of something that required more focus and stuff that maybe required less focus. And so we're going to look at all of Luke 14, but you're going to see there are, are kind of two scenes. If this was a, a movie, you'd s there would be two different backdrops behind which uh, Jesus is operating. And the first is Jesus is having this, is, is attending this formal gathering. So the first thing you can imagine, Jesus in amongst these um, kind of highfalutin, like, is that a term anymore? But these, these very important religious people, and he is hanging out with them. And then the next scene is him on the road traveling. So let's start in verse 1, like we often do. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. I'm going to pause there. As you can see, we've got um, some is a little bolder than others, and so we'll pause here. Th I think it's important for us to understand. We need to understand what Jesus knew and what Jesus understood. Jesus knew that these were the people who would ultimately plot to have him killed. They were also the people who were constantly, and, and actually we see this in the next part of the text, they were watching him closely. These are people that kind of watched him with, um, we'll, we'll see, with evil intent. They were looking for him to mess up. They were looking to poke holes in his teachings and in his actions. And yet Jesus intentionally goes to be with them. So I, I think that's important. There's actually a, I've got two quotes. I never put two quotes on a page, but there's two quotes here. One from William Barclay, one from John Trapp. So this is unprecedented. Here we go. The word used for watching is the word used for interested and sinister espionage. Jesus was under scrutiny. His every move was being watched with intentionality. And John Trapp says, they watched him intently as a dog doth for a bone. Very old English there. All right, let's carry on in verse 2. 
there in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling in his body. Uh, it's called, uh, they refer to it as dropsy in other versions. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you is a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. Now, I think the first thing I want to point out in here is that this person with dropsy was an invited guest, uh, very intentionally brought into this place. And one of the things I was uh, learning about dropsy is it's a very, uh, there are very physical symptoms to, to having dropsy. There's a lot of swelling in the body. And, and, and so this would have been a very physically ill person that was being brought. And, and I don't think it's a stretch to assume that this person was brought in and probably put in Jesus' eyesight as a test, knowing this was the Sabbath. Would Jesus do this? Would he dare heal somebody on the Sabbath? Jesus turns it and, and, and he makes it about what it's actually about. He says, is, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He doesn't have to ask them if it's okay for him to heal him. He's putting it out there, does it make a difference that today is a Sabbath day? Should I, should I not heal him? And it says here, he healed him, he took him and healed him and let him go. And I love the matter-of-factness of that statement. This wasn't Jesus kind of doing anything ritualistic or ceremonial, organizing people in rows and saying this rote prayer. He just kind of pulled him aside, healed him, and sent him away. There's no fanfare. This wasn't heavy lifting for Jesus. He just did it. And I think it's important to understand, again, if we're watching kind of in the theater of the mind, this man with dropsy, when he was healed, these physical, very physical symptoms would have transformed in front of their very eyes. All of the swelling in his body, he would have shrunk back to his normal size. I pray that prayer for me, that, uh, that something would happen and I'd be healed and my body would shrink back to the size it's supposed to be. But um, there would have been this very, like, obvious physical change in this man as he was healed. And I think it's hilarious, the, the focus of these Pharisees was totally distracted by the miraculous thing that happened in their, in their presence before their very eyes. And instead, they were like, oh, oh, oh he's done this on the Sabbath. And Jesus calls them out. He, he confronts them. He's like, well, which of you, if you're, if you're a child, and different versions, some say donkey and ox, and this version says child and ox. Long story short, something precious to you that needs rescuing. If it falls in a ditch or in a well, are you, are you going to just leave it there? Well, can't do anything about it today. See you tomorrow, kid. It's, it's not going to happen. It's this obvious, like it's a rhetorical question. Are you going to do that? No, obviously not. So they couldn't answer him. One reason they couldn't answer him was that in using this analogy, Jesus appealed to something good in their accusers, in his accusers. They had a softness of heart, whether it be for a child or even for their, their favorite donkey or ox. And it's reminded me, um, I like one of my favorite things to do is watch shows with my kids. And uh, usually it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. We'll choose a, a, a series that we, we go through and we enjoy together. And one of them, I'm not going to tell you the name of the show because I do not want to endorse it. It's, but it's about these, you could probably figure it out, uh, these Colombian drug smugglers. And in, in any... 30 seconds span, any, any 30 second span that you watch, there's probably a, a dozen or so people that get killed in the show. Very violent, lots of people dying. Well, I had this moment of realization a little later on. I, I, I might get the story wrong. I might even be confusing this with a different show I watched. But uh, there was a point where the person's dog or cat was killed to send a message to one of these drug lords. And I remember the, oh, no! Not the cat. I don't even like cats. Not, not the cat or not the dog. And I was like really affected by, sorry, I'm spitting like crazy today. Uh, I was really affected by 
the, the death, the needless sacrifice of this animal. But I wasn't really bothered by all these people that were shooting other people. And, and Jesus kind of leverages the same thing here, where, where he's like, you have this heart for some things. Why are you so hard on people? Why can't you love people the way you love these other things? So he's appealing or, or, or poking at something that is in them, that there is this heart for people or things um, that he's kind of appealing to there. Let's move on to verse 7. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. So remember, again, he's in this very formal setting with very important people. He tells them the story. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, well, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you're invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is Jesus speaking to the hearts. Again, he's got this spiritual gift of discernment where he can see into the hearts of his hosts and he sees pride. He sees this elevated self-worth. They feel pretty good about themselves. And so he takes this opportunity to tell this parable. And again, it's a, a real-life illustration set, along, set alongside a biblical truth to give an example. Now, these are not fables. They're not myths. This is a, a story with a very Im important purpose. And what you need to understand is that he chose as the backdrop for his story really the most important social occasion in a Jewish person's life, and that's this wedding feast, this gathering. And we have a lot of these elements still today. Uh, I don't know how many of you were married and, and had a head table at the reception, but can you imagine somebody showing up to your wedding reception and then pulling up a seat right beside uh, the, the bride and groom at the head table? And then imagine the humiliation when somebody has to come up to them and say, well, this is actually reserved for his brother, and that's not your space. You'll just need to find a different spot. And all that's left is the very back of the back. And so Jesus is telling this story. He said, don't puff yourself up. Don't put yourself in a prominent position. Don't, don't think too highly of yourself. Don't be so full of pride. Because what will happen is you will get knocked down. Conversely, if you come in humbly, sit in a humble place, there is the opportunity for somebody to come and say, no, 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 that's not a spot for you. You're meant to sit closer. You're meant to sit in this more prominent, important spot. And this is, a, a I think, a beautiful example, an illustration of this, this teaching, this truth, that those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be will be exalted. Church, this is something that I am, am growing more and more blown away with by the frequency of Jesus' teaching for us to humble ourselves. And we need, I am convinced, we need to develop this alarm system in our lives when we notice pride, or we just need to get better at noticing pride in our lives. Whether it be more overt pride where we kind of catch ourselves looking down on, other, on others. Or whether we catch ourselves judging others. Because when we judge, we have established the moral high ground where we don't have this problem. But boy, they've got this problem. And, and we need to develop this alarm system for pride. We need to be alert for those times where we feel a little bit too good about ourselves. This isn't to say that we should have poor outlooks on ourselves. That's a, it, we got to keep it in balance. Let's move along. Verse 12. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back so you will be repaid. 
But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And I'll just comment quickly on this, this section. How often do we leverage social opportunities for our personal gain or our, f- our personal elevation of status or to find our way into a group? And Jesus is saying, don't do that. Don't do that. He said, when you invite somebody, invite somebody who can't repay you. And, and have fun with that, because if, if that's the case, if you can't be repaid in this time, guess what? You will be repaid in eternity. That's when you'll receive your reward. It, your reward. If you invite somebody to your house, with the hope that, hey, maybe I'll get invited back to their house. Maybe you will get ba- invited to their house. And that's that. That's your reward. You got to see their house. You got to in, in, investigate their powder room. Right? So that, that is your reward. But Jesus is saying there's something better available to you. Invite somebody who can't give you something better in this earthly time and space. And your reward will be in heaven. Verse 15 says... When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. I'm going to pause there. It's, it, it's like Jesus has, has been almost hammering the hosts one thing after another and, and has brought up these different things. They have this tense moment where he heals somebody on the Sabbath and has to talk to them about that. Now he has this tense moment about teaching people to be humble. And I don't think there's any, like, there's no confusion about who Jesus is teaching this lesson to. It's the people who are prideful. And so it's almost like there's this tension in the room, and this one guy, just trying to be a nice guy, blessed is the one who eat, who will eat at the, fe- and at the feast in the kingdom of God. And it's as though he's trying to break the tension in the room. It's like, okay, you guys, we're actually all on the same page here. We're, we're buddies. Can't we all just get along? And, and that's kind of the, the tone of that question. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. So he goes into another parable here. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything now is ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Let's pause there. Jesus delves into this next parable. And um, and, and there's a lot of parable uh, parallels in, the, in this parable. There's a lot of, I think there are more than, there might be more than one application, or the it's more allegorical than a lot of parables. One thing we need to understand is there's this kind of tradition at the time where the date, because they probably didn't have Google Calendar, they they had to make the date known well in advance. And that's an assumption I think we can live under with this parable, is that in this story, the guests would have been notified, this is happening, and you've got lots of time to prepare for it. But what they would do is they would announce the date, but as far as when it was time to come in, that would probably be announced at on the day of. And that's what we see here. Now the word is going out, and the people are being reminded of their invitation. But they start to come up with excuses. Verse 19 says, another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, What you ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servant, Go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in, so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Now, it's interesting. The the first two excuses are, are excuses based on material things. 
One guy says, I, I bought a piece of ground. Another says, I've got uh, five yoke of oxen. And they're both material, but they're also foolish. Uh, the, one of the commentators, he, he points out, who buys land and then goes to see what it's like? Right? It's, it's, that's dumb. It, you would have, in, it, with a real estate purchase, you're probably going to go at least look at it online, right? And, and so for him to say he's got to go look at it now is just, it's a foolish excuse. It's an insulting excuse. Similarly, who buys five yoke of oxen without testing them first to see if they can pull? To see if they can do the job that you're spending your money for? These are foolish and insulting excuses to avoid this wedding feast. Then another one says, I have married a wife. This is an excuse of a man who puts his family before anything else, which sounds noble, right? As a, as a father, it feels good for me to say I would do anything for my family. My family, family is everything. Family is the most important thing. You know, one of the best things that we can do for our families is to let them know, to demonstrate that God is first. That they are not first. That they don't supersede, they don't trump the position of God in our lives. And it's, it's a hard thing to say. And you know what? As a, as a father of, of three, Carly and I had to work through this. We had we have three active now adult kids. By the way, my daughter's 18, not 19. I was um, corrected on that last week when I co referred to her as a 19-year-old. She's just so mature that um, sometimes I, I lose sight of her actual age. But we had, have, it sounds like they're dead. They're not. They're, we, have, we have three uh, kids who are very active and involved in sports and things came up. And there was always this tension of... Like, we don't want to be religious about gathering on the weekends. But there's also this, this tension here. How do we show that God is first in our lives if we don't live that out with our kids? Now, the, the owner of, of, the, house, of, the, of the one who's putting on the feast in this parable, he, he makes it known there is still going to be a feast. Even though the turnout does not look like it's going to be great. There's still going to be a feast. And he says, go out again. Compel them to come in. And there's a good quote here from F.F. F. Bruce. It says, this reflects in the first place the urgent desire of the master to have an absolutely full house. In the second, the feeling that pressure will be needed to overcome the incredulity of country people as to the invitation to them being meant seriously. They would be apt to laugh in the servant's in the servant's face. I love, I love this idea. Well, this truth. That God's will is that none would perish. I think Jeanne brought this up in prayer a couple weeks ago. We need to remember that His will is that none should perish. We were teaching about the narrow gate. I think last week. God's will is that everybody finds their way, chooses the narrow gate. And in the same way we see in this parable, the, 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 the person running or inviting people to the feast, he wants everybody there. He took the steps to invite specifically some people. And we see one of the parallels here is there's this, this, this allusion to the Jewish people. They were God's chosen people. And they were given first invitation to come to this feast. But some of them missed out on it like entirely. Where they had to go see their cows and their wives and their property. All right, we transition now into the second scene where he's, he's left this, this, um, this social setting, this, this party. And now he's traveling. And in verse 25, it says this. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciples. My disciple. 
And this is a tough one, and it and, and needs some close attention here. First of all, I think it's, it's important for us to understand that this traveling Jesus was doing was ultimately toward Jerusalem. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Bookmark that idea. Remember that. And he's setting apart the qualifications for being a disciple. And disciple, in this case, means a learner. If you really want to come to the school of Jesus, if you want to learn about me, if, if you want to walk with me and be in relationship with me, there are some things that need to be true. Now, this statement here, that if you don't hate your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even your own life, this is, is stark, and it's stark on purpose. Jesus is not literally telling us that I can't get along with my parents. I, I, got, I have to despise them. I have to hate them. It's this contrast thing. This shows the great difference between our allegiance to Jesus and our allegiance to everything and everyone else. There's actually a good quote about this idea of hate from Charles Spurgeon. It says, It is only in a comparative sense, and not literally, that the term can possibly be used. And to make this very clear, Christ said that we are to hate our own life. So he uses that as the ultimate example of, of this word being used for starkness and, and ba or difference pointing out in. Uh, that didn't really, I can carry on. Let's, let's go to verse 27. Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Be, I'm going to say this twice. Being a disciple of Jesus is more than just accepting the invitation for him to be our savior. Being a disciple, a learner, a follower of Jesus is more than just accepting an invitation to follow him. We are called to bear our cross and come after me, come after him. He is saying here, he's making this parallel or example that being a follower of Jesus is something like bearing a cross. And if you've ever watched any of the film interpretations of Jesus um, being crucified and carrying his cross, his literal cross, up to his death, we see this is not a light job. This is, this is not something that's just kind of Okay, it's on my list of things to do today. This is arduous, it's hard. And he uses this term, he says, their cross. A, 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 whoever does not carry their cross. And I think that's important too. He's not saying if you don't carry my cross, as in Jesus' cross, if you don't carry a cross, as in a physical cross, it's what it is that God has for you to carry needs to be carried. And so it can be different. Our burdens can be different. I, you know what? I, I look at some of your stories, and I think of some of the things that you've got to bear. And let's be honest. Some things that we have to bear are because of our own stupidity. They're, they're our own fault. We bring it on ourselves. But sometimes we're put into a, a life narrative. We're put into situations where we have to bear something that seems unfair or out of balance with what other people have to bear. And I, I don't put myself in that category. I, I feel too often I, I, I get off easy, uh, especially when I hear some of your stories and things that, that you're walking through and having to deal with. But we're called to bear our cross and come after him. And he doesn't say this from a position of you guys do this. He is doing this knowing that he would bear his own cross, literally. And he would go before us to model us. I love what Chris has shared this morning. It wasn't Chris. I love what Chris has shared this morning, but it was you when you read from Romans 8, uh, Megan, um, that we are called not just to share in his life and life everlasting, but we're called to share in his suffering. We're meant to be co-laborers. We're meant to, to, to have struggles and things we suffer through. Earlier I said, we, we need to develop this internal alarm system, this alert to pride. I think in the same way we need to develop this internal, and this is what you were talking about, Carissa, this internal alert to comfort. 
to when we are too comfortable. Because it's not comfortable carrying your cross. That's not a luxurious event. And so I think we need to be on alert for the times when we are feeling too comfortable. William Barclay says this, when Jesus said that he was on the road to Jerusalem, excuse me, when Jesus said this, he was on the road to Jerusalem, he knew that he was on the way to his cross. The crowds who were with him thought that he was on his way to an empire. They thought they were following this king who was, has, has this movement behind him and that their part in this would be to elevate him as the king of the Jews, as their Messiah, the one who came to save. So the, the, again, the narrative they, were, they, were, they thought they were a part of and walking out was something glorious where the end story would be very Disney for Jesus and he would finish as king of kings and lord of lords on this earth. What they didn't realize is that they were coming, walking with him, but he was walking to his death. His death for us. Verse 28 says, Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able to with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who, will, who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. We need to look at the cost of following Jesus. And you know what? Forgive me as your pastor for the times when I have presented or sold you on God's grace without that companion piece of the cost of following Jesus. And, and we need to be wise about looking at this cost and asking ourselves, am I willing to do that? Am I truly willing to take up my cross? And I'm, am I willing to suffer as Jesus suffered. Because he, he never promises us this bed of roses, which is a weird expression because roses have thorns, right? So maybe he does promise a bed of roses and it, it is promised to be uncomfortable. But we are called to be wise and look ahead at the cost of following Jesus. This last bit, I think it, it looks a little bit out of place in context of the rest of Luke 14, but we finish with this in Luke 34, uh, 14, verse 34. He says, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is, neither, it is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up here, and I'll finish with a couple of things here. This idea of a believer losing their saltiness, he's alluding to this, whether it be through corruption or assimilation. And assimilation is, is, a, is a dangerous and it should be a scary word. Sometimes we get comfortable in this world. Sometimes, and this is when your alarm bell should be going on, when you fit in too well with this world, when there is nothing that anybody sees in you, no fruit that makes you look different than all of the rest of the world, we should be on alert because we have become salt that has lost its saltiness. We have, we have really, we've lost our purpose or we've lost sight of our purpose of being here and now. We become just part of the scenery. We've, we, we've lost our value. And it's a scary thought. Let me just, if you want to do a little more digging, there's one more slide here. It says, if you want to learn more about salt and light, you can look in Matthew 5, verses 13 and 16. It's a, it's a beautiful teaching there. Let me finish with this. We're called to three things, and we've kind of asked you to 
set alarms or alerts for these three things. Jesus calls us over and over again to be humble. He calls us to be uncomfortable. And he calls us to be salty. And, and I think we need to remember or keep sight, or keep eyes on these three things. Our need for humility, avoiding comfort, and our, our, our need to be salty. To, to be effective and available to make a difference in this world. All right. With that, let's stand and respond and worship together, and then I'll bless, send a, give you a blessing at the end. I love songs where we sing about His holiness, where there's no poetry even. It's just like, you are holy, because He deserves our praise. He deserves our honor. May the God who modeled cross-carrying and the one who calls us to carry our own cross reveal Himself to you as a worthy inspiration to do so. As you carry your cross, let it be a humble declaration to the world about the God you serve. At this, in time, at this time, I invite you to enjoy coffee once again. It's available back in that coffee room. Linger, share your stories, be a blessing to each other. Be salty, be humble, be a little uncomfortable, and have a good week.